Hello, everybody. This is Mary Poppendick. I hope you see my full screen. I think so. Um, I've been around in the software engineering world for a long time, and today I want to talk about architecture from an historical point of view, because over the time that I've been working in this field, I've seen a lot of really great architectures, and then I've seen some maybe not quite so excellent. So let's start in 1967 at my first job, which was working in a telephone network for Bell Telephone Laboratories. And um, at that point in time, uh, I was just out of college. And if you take a look at the picture on the screen, this is the kind of technology that telephone networks had then, relatively discrete components on cards. And um, the uh, uh, discrete components had fairly high failure rates. And what the phone company was trying to do was to put in a electronic system to replace existing electromechanical systems. And in order to do that, all over the world, at least all over the Western Europe and the US, there were small stations nearby houses that had direct wiring to houses, to phones and houses and phones and business. And the, the switching happened with an electrical mechanical, essentially a relay system. And you could, you could call all across the United States, but you went through a series of relays. And they were trying to replace those. The, the interesting thing was that those were extremely reliable because if one relay failed, they just found a new path. So these sites did not go down. They pretty much were always working. And so, uh, and they were not, it's, extraordinarily expensive. So our reliability goal was we had to have the same reliability and the same cost. And the reliability goal was there for a maximum two hours downtime in 40 years. That is like three minutes a year. That's above any kind of nines that anybody has ever tried to do since. And in order to do that, we had this kind of an architecture. So there were all of the network terminals coming in from wherever they were coming in and something that would scan them. And then there were two separate program stores that were constantly working in parallel and checking each other and seeing that they matched. And um, eventually, uh, so we had completely identical pairing. And if something would go wrong, there would be a mechanism. I'm not quite exactly sure how it worked, but there would be a way to disable the faulty unit. And then also a quick way to check that, that that was the right one. And then what I did was I was writing diagnostic programs to find the bad component, the bad card, because we couldn't allow the office to be without this pairing for very long. And finding the bad card was a challenge. So we did it with software and printed out a repair ticket. And within a very short time, the operator would replace the bad component, restore dual processing mode, and, and uh, it would be back up in its normal mode. So this was a highly redundant architecture. Um, the only way they could deal with the fact that all of these discrete components were going to fail was to make sure that there was redundancy and a way to decide which redundancy piece to use and a way to repair the bad piece. Therefore, easily half, probably more, of both the hardware and the software in this system was pretty much to provide the redundancy so that we maintained that uptime. So did it work? Did we get maximum two hours in 40 years? Well, 40 years is a long time. And this went live in uh, 69, I believe. Um, so that would have taken it past the year 2000. Um, well, there was an article published in Computer Magazine by the head of this program who said, yeah, when it worked, we got a maximum. We got very, very reliable systems. In fact, people when power went out and storms came by, would still rely on the fact that their phone system would work. But in 1990, there was a routine failover at one of the switching stations, and it began a cascading outage that shut down half of the phone system in the U.S. for nine hours. Now, half of the T-Mobile phone system worldwide for nine hours about 10 days ago, you might remember, this is not an unusual concept. We've seen electrical grids gone out for a significant amount of time. And what happens is, and what happened then, was that 
even though everything was replicated and there was redundancy, a failure cascaded to all of the other like systems and took the whole system out. Um, and we've seen this, we still see it. It's a feature of this architecture actually. So redundancy is great, but when you have cascading failures, you don't have as much reliability as you had been planning at. So let's go to the 1970s. This is when ARPANET got started. Um, and if you look at 1971, there weren't that many. In April, there were, this is how many uh, uh, computers there were on the network. And in fact, those things called IMP, that's an interface message processor, those computers were broke by Newman type little mini computers. And they served exactly the same as my um, switching system that I worked for at Bell Labs. This is really a reflection of the telephone network where you have uh, message processors, which were our switching systems. And those particular processors would then go to like MIT or uh, Harvard or wherever the various places were. And they would support two or three computers at that particular point. Uh, so that's what the early ARPANET looked like. And this wasn't any different from a failure perspective as the telephone network. It's still vulnerable to cascading failures. Another thing it was vulnerable to is those message processors being many computers, they got out of date pretty darn fast. And so if you think about that, um, uh, in 1972, Louis Poisson from France came to the US and said, well, this is a really nice architecture. I would really like to do this. But, um, you know, we don't have any companies, any phone companies or any other companies that would support those message processors. They're not willing to do that, not on a European wide basis. We would love to have a European wide network, but I can't see all of the phone companies across the Europe working with each other and having the same type of a switching processor. It's not going to work. Um, uh, what I would like to see is the host responsible for data exchange. So all of the folks here in the U.S. said to him, well, best of luck with that. And uh, he went home to try to figure out how to make this work. And he put together a network called Cyclades, which effectively took the IMPs out, the interface message processors out, and created um, uh, what is today the Internet architecture. In 1974... Vinton Cerf and Robert Kahn mimicked, copied pretty much what Louis Poisson had done in France and created the TCP IP protocol, which is pretty much the backbone of the internet today. This is a great architecture. Um, and their, their design goal was that each distinct network had to stand on its own with no internal changes. So if you had a computer, it didn't have to be changed. There was no information retained by gateways and routers, so you can't have cascading failures. There was no global control at the operations level and communications was on a best efforts basis. You didn't have to acknowledge a transmission. Up until that time, if you would send a message, email, well, email wasn't there yet, but any kind of message, you had to wait for an acknowledgement. And you know what? Every so often you wouldn't get the acknowledgement back and everything would be tied up. We've seen this in database hangups and stuff like that. So the best efforts basis felt like a step backwards, but effectively it was a step in, in favor of reliability. What this does is isolate faults to the hosts that have them instead of having them able to cascade across identical message processors. And this fault isolation along with the kind of redundancy, uh, well, you actually don't need redundancy because you basically, when there is a fault, it's, not able to be cascaded because every single network at its local level is in charge of making sure that it, it takes care of itself and, and communicates directly out onto the network to others. This is the reason why the internet is so reliable. In addition to having redundancy, lots and lots of processors, um, when there's a fault, it doesn't propagate. And um, that kind of architecture is the same architecture we have on the internet today. And if you look at any extremely large scale architecture, it's pretty much the same thing. There are not things like message processors that can cascade failures. There are separate local control 
of uh, isolation and local control of false. So now let's go to the 70s and 80s. And at the point in time, I got a job doing process control systems. I was programming computers to control big roll goods processes at 3M. Um, I was also doing some digitizing of film at the University of Wisconsin for bubble chamber film digitization. But in all cases, my many computers were controlling uh, various pieces of large pieces of equipment. The way that a process control architecture looked in 1980s is this. There was a mini computer, I programmed that. And uh, at the mini computer was an operator station. This was the person responsible for the tape making or whatever roll good process or whatever other process was being managed. The mini computer got recipes for different types of, of uh, tape, for example, from a, a storage area, a disk, and it kept historical records. <coughs> and then it had a bus. And the interface bus went down to proportional integral differential controllers that were at, attached to every single uh, thing that needed to be controlled, motor, pump, heater, cooler, anyway, all of the analog devices. And the mini computer would send set points down, just like you send a set point to your car when you set the speed, you send a set point to an analog controller telling it what temperature to do or whatever. And it would send back, here's how it's doing. Here's the speed, the flow, the thickness. And the mini computer might calculate a new, uh, a new gain or something, but pretty much the controllers all by themselves managed all of the control unless a set point was gonna be changed by the operator. So what you have here is edge computing because we had the theory that the mini computer didn't need to be replicated if it went down, if it went down which it was going to do, of course, then whatever, we would just continue along with the existing set point. There were also digital controllers, uh, programmable logic controllers. These were controllers that mimic the old relay logic that you saw at the telephone company. And it, it did things like switches and timers and it communicated events and got some event instructions from the mini computer. But you can see what here is we're controlling objects. And those objects are sending events back to the mini computer. But fundamentally, this is a edge computing focused design because nobody trusted the mini computer to be reliable. Um, so it was all about local control because if you were controlling a very fast motor or you know speed of, or high temperature or anything like that, you did not wanna have to depend upon that mini computer being there in order to be safe. So very much focused on local control. Now, if we move on from there, and let's go into the 80s and 90s, an architecture that I actually didn't do much with, but I saw a lot of in big companies was the client server, server architectures, one tier, two tier, three tiers. The classic client server architecture was a three tier architecture. There were some presentation devices, there were some application servers, and there was a big database server. And, um, the problem is this one single database server, and there was only one, it violated redundancy, fault isolation, and local control basics. Um, there was just one. It, it was redundant, but the backup took forever to get to, so you really couldn't count on it. And um, it didn't mean that those people out there at the workstations had any kind of local control. If that database went out, they couldn't continue. So why was there just one of these back here? Well, there was this CAP theorem. And the CAP theorem pretty much said, um, you can't have consistent data, available data, constant, co completely available, and partitioning all at the same time. You had to give up one. And so, of course, everybody gave up partitioning. And we migrated to massive central databases because the CAP theorem said, of course, you've got to have consistency. Of course, you must have instant availability. So you have to give up any type of, of uh, distributed database. Um, so that was what was going on uh, in the 80s and 90s. But in the 90s, we started seeing that's when hyperlinks came into being. And we eventually got to the internet. The interesting thing about hyperlinks is that hyperlinks are about... Um, they're about text-centric thinking rather than data-centric. 
Hyperlinks, don't worry about this big central database. It seems so important to all of the very large companies. Well, how could the database not be important? It contains our whole life. It contains everything we know about our company and our customers and our products and our inventory. How could it not be important? But hyperlinks went all over the place and you know it was like blown in the wind kind of stuff. And um, it was more like having a library rather than having a vault. And it was just a new idea for a different way of thinking about how you use computers. Another thing that happened in the 90s, actually it first happened in the late 1980s. There was a paper published at ACM SIGMOD conference in June of 1988. And it was, it, it shook the world because it was a, a case for redundant arrays of inexpensive disks. That's where the word RAID came from. But it wasn't just about disks. It was this. If you have lots of stuff that fails often and you manage the failures with redundancy and switching out the bad stuff and not losing anything and maintaining the impact of the failure, you can have a system that is more reliable than one great big massive central server that rarely fails. Because the bigger you get, the rarely is still sometimes, and you will always have some sort of hardware failure. So maybe you have to have a whole different mental model about how you think about reliability. Um, it was a really novel concept in 1988, um, and it eventually came to dominate the way we started thinking about computers. So let's go to, 19, to 2000 in the spring. And Google is a brand new company, and it's getting a lot of press because it's doing a pretty good job of serving up uh, information from crawling the web. And the problem is that, uh, and it's got a contract now with Yahoo, but it keeps crashing. Uh, oh, nobody could figure out why the indexing software just didn't work. So these two engineers, Jeff Dean and Sanjay Gimwat, had just been hired from the DEC Research Lab uh, uh, maybe a year before, and they started thinking really hard about what was going on and at great level of detail. And um, in fact, they received the ACM Computer Award in 2012 for the work that they did on this particular area. And what they discovered is, as you got big, guess what? Hardware fails. And they had some faulty hardware. The index was on a computer that every so often lost some bits out of the memory. And the memory was really, really, really reliable. But doesn't matter how many, you know, how many zeros you put on your reliability, if you get more zeros on your usage, you're going to have failures. So they created an architecture that was going to live with failure and they spent a huge amount of time figuring out how to optimize it to run fast. That's the chunk file system that you see. This is the original, actually, um, it maintains, it's generally a good sketch of how Google store stuff, three copies of little chunks of stuff. And then it has a, a, some servers keeping track of where the chunks are. And when, uh, let's say, the middle one fails, well, you've got two more copies. You can also figure out which one's wrong. So it's always better to vote with three than two to figure out which one's wrong. You can knock out the bad piece of hardware, regenerate the third thing on a good piece of hardware, tell people to pull that disk or whatever it is, memory out of the system, and go from there. So in one sense, this is sort of going back to what we were trying to do at Bell Labs because when you get to a certain size, no matter how reliable your hardware is, it's going to fail. We knew when we were doing process control that no matter how reliable our hardware was, it would fail. And that's what you, they finally had to figure out here in order to create both redundancy and also some way to isolate faults if something went wrong and vote to see which one is the good one and knock the bad one out. Same time frame, um, crisis was happening at Amazon because they had that, you know, the, the architecture, the client server architecture. They had a big front end, big back end, and the biggest database server in the world they, 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 they bought. They, it could not keep up. 
Same problem. At some point, a single server is not going to be able to keep up. So they had two choices. Option one was to handle a whole bunch more transactions somehow, somewhere. And those were ACID transactions. ACID transactions are automatic, uh, atomic, consistent, isolated, and durable. And atomic means you keep all of the pieces of the transaction together in a package. And you make sure that that package is complete before you actually present it to users. You make sure that you validated that all the right stuff has been done. On, and this was all done by a database. That was one option, figure out how to do that better. Option two was to throw out the ACID transactions and look at this concept of eventual consistency, which allowed partitioning. Eventual consistency meant, what if you weren't perfectly consistent? What if you eventually got consistent? And hey, if somebody pulls us, somebody, you allow somebody to order something that actually physically isn't on a shelf, you know, maybe that's not as bad as completely tying up because you've got these big asset transactions. So they decided to choose option two break the transactions into small services and manage each service with software. And by the way, because that was their architecture, small services, they ran up against this thing called Conway's Law, which I imagine you've heard of, which says your organizational structure and your system architecture pretty much are going to match, so you may as well get used to it and let it match. So what Amazon did in addition to having services was uh, they organized into small teams that were completely responsible for a service. The team itself had all of the necessary people to, to uh, not just decide what to do and program, but also to operate and be responsible for operations of a service. Those were complete whole teams that had complete service responsibility. Um, in fact, they wanted to self-deploy. Instead of having a lot of other services that they depended on, they wanted to be able to deploy independently. When this was happening in the mid, you know, 2003, four, five timeframe, the idea of team self-deploying was really novel because, um, you know, how could a team deploy because there was so many dependencies? And if you didn't test all these dependencies, how could things not blow up? So um, Amazon designed uh, and came up with a way that they were going to figure out how to do um, this whole concept of independent team deploying. It took them about from 2002 to six to figure out how to create an environment in which teams could self-deploy. There were an awful lot of pieces to this infrastructure it was very complicated to put together. Um, and when they, the reason they figured out how to do it in some extent was because Jeff Bezos said he had this belief that if you wanted to seriously get large and scale, there's no way you could do it unless you had autonomous decision-making. And autonomous decision-making meant small autonomous teams. Teams of the size of number of people that can talk to each other and come to an agreement and be completely responsible for something. So not only did they have a service architecture, they also had to figure out how to allow those teams to deploy separately, which really was something people didn't do at that point in time. As they figured out how to do it and they figured out how to have these services have contracts with other services, how to have upgrades of one particular service and not the others, and all of that sort of stuff, they, as they figured all of that out, they began to offer it as something that other people could buy. And the first Amazon Web Services was offered as uh, EC2, I think, in 2006. And uh, I guess you could say the rest is history. They became bigger and bigger as they learned how to do this uh, service-orientated architecture and offer it up to other people. And, you know, that's where we get the cloud from. Uh, if you think about the dependency problem and what they were struggling up against, and we were, most of us, except for possibly Amazon and maybe Google, in 2010, we were still just struggling against this concept of an enterprise architecture. This is what it looks like. There's a business. It has business data. There are some applications that do good things. And underneath that all is some technology. 
And really in the 1990s, and I certainly believe this in the 1990s, one of the most important things for a business to do was to have a central uh, ERP, you know, database, something where all of the resources of the entire organization could be figured out, managed, scheduled, and one central database. Many companies spent a lot of years trying to figure out how to switch to that mode, trying to get all their disparate data into a single normalized database. Um, that was the thing you did in the 1990s. I can remember it. And um, the problem with that is that if you have an application that wants to change the way the data is structured, you go to the central database and every other application is using it, which means that if you change one application, all the other applications that use the data are going to have to be checked out to make sure you haven't done anything bad to them. And so that central database became a massive dependency generator. And what we saw was longer and longer and longer release times because of the tight dependencies of all of the applications based on the central database. And then, you know, in 2007, we started seeing something like a, more like a smartphone architecture. And on a smartphone, you know what it is. You have independent apps and they don't get to talk to each other. By and large, your apps are pretty independent of each other and they're pretty isolated from each other. If something goes wrong, well, the other one doesn't get to, to do anything particular. Uh, it doesn't really, it's almost sort of like the internet. It doesn't get to have impact on other uh, apps. It only gets its own little piece of territory that it can do bad stuff in. And in that area, it's completely responsible. So if you look at a microservice architecture, it's the same concept. You have applications, you have data, you have a business objective that each application is trying to do. You have a technology platform and using APIs, by the way, they are talking to each other through the technology platform to figure out how to pass data, but they're not having direct dependencies upon each other. And if you think of APIs, I like to think of them as the thing that allows us not to have dependencies because of a database. And I also like to think of them as the thing that's replaced the central database because the central database defined all of the interactions once upon a time amongst applications. And now that's done by APIs. And the really novel thing here was distributed data stores. I don't know if you realize how incredibly shocking it was to come across the concept that Amazon didn't have a central database in the mid 2000s because wow, how could a big retail business possibly operate without a big central database? It was something that I scratched my head over. I said either Amazon knows something I don't know or uh, they've got it wrong. Well, it turns out they knew something I didn't know. So what you have here is much more local control of what's going on at the service level and a huge amount more adaptation adaptability because each team can do a very rapid change to what it's doing without anybody else caring. And you see that on a smartphone, you can update one app and not all the rest of them. That was never done in an enterprise setting because everything was hooked together with that database. But when you get all of these services and all of these APIs, the question has come up many times, and it's been a really interesting problem. If you've got all these autonomous teams that can separately deploy, and they can do whatever they particularly want with their API, how do you get a big thing done? How do you coordinate across all of them? How do you make important stuff happen? Um, I would propose that we can go back to hardware driven uh, that's driven by software to look at an example of how that actually happens. Um, here you see the first double landing of booster rockets from the February 6, 2018 launch of Falcon Heavy, uh, an amazing picture because this is the first time that this, this joint landing of these rockets was really amazing. And there is a company that has accomplished massive missions, uh, very much coordinated, and they've done it really well. They've done it by figuring out how to coordinate across autonomous teams because that, um, at uh, SpaceX, 
they have a thing called the philosophy of responsibility. And it's that engineers are responsible for a component that they're responsible for. It could be one of those, it could be a fuel thing, it could be an engine, it could be, you know, it could be something that's controlling the uh, legs that the, the satellite's gonna land on, whatever, they have lots of separate components then those are in bigger components and in bigger components. So they do a good um, systems engineering job. And engineers are responsible for the design and the development of their component and for making sure their component operates exactly the way it is supposed to operate. But also they are responsible for understanding what their component is supposed to do as part of the overall system and making sure it does its part. And it's that second part. You can have all these independent teams, but they also have to understand what the job of their service is as part of the overall system to accomplish the overall mission and make sure that their piece does its part. If you take a look at before those rockets were able to land, you can see a video that uh, Musk put out about all of the times that they crashed uh, when they were trying to figure out how to land booster rockets. And you never ever saw a, uh, space program before that uh, thought crashes were something to brag about, but he did. Um, and the reason is because they felt that it was important to learn fast and learn by trying things at the right point in time. So if you were involved in a crash and your little piece happened to not do its part of its job as part of the overall system, you could be sure you had 24 hours before you would be reporting to Musk about exactly what went wrong and how you were gonna never let it happen again. So thus all the monitoring, all of the videos because any engineer had better know if anything went wrong, exactly what happened. Because the philosophy of responsibility, according to John Matori, he's a SpaceX launch director, used to be in NASA. And he said, there's no engineering process in existence can replace the philosophy of responsibility for getting things done right and getting things done efficiently. So when you have a lot of small teams, that doesn't mean you don't have an overall mission. It means that every team has to understand where they fit in the overall mission. Okay, now if we go on to uh, 2015, so we're not so far out, um, that's when Lambda was introduced. And Lambda is event-driven functions that run in the cloud. An interesting concept. It seemed kind of weird to a lot of people at first, but when I saw Lambda in 2015, Tom can attest to this, I said, that's gonna be big. And the reason I thought it was gonna be big is because Lambda reminded me a whole lot of our, um, of our process control systems that would send event interrupts into my mini computer and then I would have to do something about it. And very much this concept of running event-driven software was what I did in some of my really earliest programming because I was taking interrupts from objects that had an event that wanted to tell me something and then I had to figure out how to do something about it. So this to me made a lot of sense. And um, as we go along, we can look at various types of uh, abstractions but if you take this idea of Lambda, think about a few of the other abstractions that we have been talking about. We've been talking about how the internet sort of abstracted the telephone network into a higher level of, of things, but it basically was a kind of abstract version of the telephone network. If you think about the cloud, it's basically taken data centers and abstracted them off to to a central cloud area instead of individual data centers all over. And if you take a look at Lambda or serverless in general, it's pretty much taking infrastructure that we used to need orchestration for. I mean, when you have these services and you have all of them, you put, or put uh, building blocks. Um, there you go. Well, you, you put together, um, Docker type containers. containers, yes. You have all these containers and they are a one level of abstraction and then you put some sort of orchestration on top of that and you have another level of orchestration and then along comes serverless and all of a sudden you actually don't have to think about orchestration at all that's taken care of by the whole underlying concept. 
So that takes and moves out all of the details we used to have to worry about into a different kind of thinking about an architecture. Another thing that happened in 2012 that's really interesting. Um, in 2012, Jeffrey Hinton headed up a team at the University of Toronto. Uh, he had been working on neural networks since the 1980s when, by the way, when I was doing process control systems at that time, we were thinking about how you use neural networks to help process control systems to learn. And, um, and when, when um, that happened, uh, we just simply could not figure out how to use the, the meager compute power that we had to make neural networks work. He was one of the few people that continued research in this area for years and years when he was pretty much a loner. He started out in uh, the UK, he moved to the US, he eventually moved to Canada and set up a lab in Toronto. And people thought he was kind of strange, but he kept talking about this. And um, he gathered graduate students. And in about 2006, high-speed processing finally caught up to his ideas and made the, the layering and layering of neural networks a, a technical possibility. And all of a sudden, about three years later, you started seeing seriously good speech recognition based on some of the neural network ideas. And then um, come uh, about the same time, uh, Fei-Fei Li, who was a young professor, uh, was looking at artificial intelligence. And she had also this far out weird idea that um, it's not the algorithm that's the problem. It's the data that's the problem. We do not have enough data for learning on. And if we would create a big way of learning, then we could figure out what the right uh, algorithm is. So she spent some years creating ImageNet, which was a very big, labeled uh, uh, labeled uh, image database. She used Mechanical Turk from Amazon to have all kinds of people around the world label images of all types and created this massive image database. And then every year there was what was called the ImageNet challenge where a certain subset of this was, was uh, released and teams of AI experts were challenged to figure out if they could get an algorithm that would recognize the what the different images were. And in hi, 2000, Marie. yes. Yeah, hi, Marie, we need to wrap up. So if you have one last idea, because we've went oh, over time. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I, I lost track of the time. Uh, okay, so in 2012, there was an astonishing, uh, I'm just about done, I promise. There was an astonishing uh, improvement and all of a sudden we had seriously good, uh, seriously good uh, smart systems. Um, I'm going to skip this slide here and I'm going to go to this last one. So now it's 2020 and we have to start thinking about what do we need to do to architect for black swan events. We need to have systems that have an architecture that's adaptable, that has high redundancy, that has great fault tolerance and local responsibility. And if we can do that, then um, we will get some very interesting and great architectures. So thank you. And I'm sorry that I lost track of time. I was heading no, for more like everybody is asking for you to finish. So if you allow me, we will reinvite you to another API days for a one hour long talk. If you allow us, because everybody's asking for it. So I apologize. Are... I'm sorry. Yeah. No, 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 no. Uh, it was anyway. I am done. Yeah. Thank you. Amazing talk, Mary. Uh, thank you very much.